Welcome to the Mind and Club Theology Podcast, hosted by Miriam Keith and Amy Panton, which come out of the Canadian Journal of Theology, Mental Health, and Disability. We both live and work on lands that have been homes and remain homes to the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, the Neutral, and the Ojibwe Chippewa peoples and other peoples who have cared for the land. We are grateful for the opportunity to live and work on this land and are mindful of the need to repair broken covenants. This podcast is an opportunity to model how faith communities can engage in theological and spiritual conversations around madness and cryptness. If you need a full transcript, you can find our videos on our YouTube channel. We want to say before we begin that topics and conversations we are raising throughout our time together are often hard. They are hard for mad and quick people ourselves and hard for our families and loved ones. So do what you need to do to take care of yourselves, your bodies, minds, and hearts. And now... Here is our episode. Welcome to the Mad and Crypt Theology Podcast. We're so happy to be with you today. And Miriam and I are joined by our dear friend, Laura McGregor. And today we thought we would do something a little different. We decided we're going to flip the, flip the script or turn the tables today and Miriam and I are going to talk about the research we're doing for our PhDs and Laura is going to be asking us some questions so we're really excited for this opportunity we've had a few people ask us to you know we want to hear from you and Miriam what are you guys working on so today's the day so so welcome Laura thank you I'm excited to be here I'm looking forward to hearing more about your work Thanks. Well, Laura has uh, devised some very excellent questions that she's going to be asking us, leading us through the next hour. So we're very excited. So, so please, Laura, take it away. All right. Well, thanks so much. Um, I'm thrilled that, yeah, I'm thrilled that I'm the one who gets to ask the questions today and I don't need to be nervous about whether I have any meaningful answers. So I, I like the fact that you guys are in the hot seat. We um, get to be nervous. Today. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Yay. All right. Um, so I was wondering if we could start with the classic elevator pitch about your work. So um, if each of you could maybe take a few minutes and provide a quick summary uh, that captures the, the themes of your work. Um, ideally in everyday language, that would be great. So who wants to go first? Who's, what's your elevator pitch summarizing your work? I can go if, if uh, I'll take the plunge. So, so okay, so, so my work, my research is on self-injury. So self-injury is when you burn or cut or bruise your skin And the sort of clinical definition is that it's with the absence of suicidal intent. So basically people self-injure in order to feel better. Usually when things are going a little bit crazy in their lives and their emotions are all over the place, they're experiencing intense emotions, people might self-injure in order to make, to have a calm or peace come over them. And the flip side of that is they may self-injure in order to feel something instead of nothing. So my research is investigating the lived experience of people who self-injure so that the church can provide care for people 
who do this. And it is a big thing. Uh, recent, some recent studies have come out, um, about one in four people within the United States, it's about the same for here in Canada, self-injure. And it's not only sort of in the global north, it also impacts a lot of people around the world. So more research is coming out from different countries, China, Indonesia, um, the Middle East. Um, not, it's not just, and Europe. Um, and a lot of people are doing this. So my, my research is just asking, why is this going on? And how can the church respond uh, in a caring and loving way? Because there hasn't been a lot of response from the church up until this point. From the social sciences, we've seen a lot from psychiatry and psychology over the past hundred years, but not from theology. Theology has been a little bit um, silent, I might say, on this topic. So I want to dig in. My, my research is looking at memoirs written by people who self-injure, and I want to figure out what's happening, you know, why is it happening, and how can the church respond in a healing way. So that was my elevator pitch. I hope that was good. <laughs> that was very helpful. Thank you. I just have a, a one quick follow-up question. So are the yeah. memoirs specifically theological in, in, uh, in nature? Are they geared to be spiritual journeys or are they memoirs of self-injury more broadly? There's a few that are written from sort of like a quote unquote Christian perspective. So the memoirists themselves might have a Christian faith, um, but no, well, actually there's one written like by a Christian, kind of like for a Christian audience, and all the rest of them are just like regular folks who are writing about their life experience. Um, but I was surprised as I, and I've been surprised um, as I've been going through and doing my research that most, if not all of the memoirs mention God somewhere, um, whether it's through, you know, regular spiritual practices like going to church and praying and that kind of stuff or it might be the faith of someone's grandparents or parents so it's all kind of like intertwined and that's what I'm trying to tease out you know where's God in this phenomenon of self-injury and how can the church um, respond in a way that is not damaging to people who self-injure and we'll probably get into some of that a little bit more later today thank you Thank you. That was very helpful. Miriam, um, can you share a quick elevator pitch summarizing your work in everyday language? Yeah. Um, so my work comes from my own personal experience of being ordained in the United States and then struggling to find a position. When I was ordained, before I was ordained, I used the logic to say my disability is not all of me, it's part of me. And so I think like, I preach the same way I do, patrol care the same way I lead worship the same way as the norm. And looking back on that, I think I was very naive. That's a naive way of looking at my body through the normative case. And so I went into PhD work and Tom Reynolds introduced me to disability and cliff studies where they talk about bodies being this work and creating something different than the norm. Not better or worse, just different. So my work now is 
appear in Crip Studies with Theology, which doesn't happen that often, to imagine what Crip Ministers offer to the church that's different from the norm and that can be life giving as life giving as other ministers. And so I'm hoping to use incarnational theology a theology of preaching patrol care and sacraments and think about them to the crib lens to imagine how how it could be how my ministry might function in the church. Is that in everyday language, I hope? It is, though I am going to ask uh, a follow-up question as well. Um, for those people who may be listening and aren't familiar with the terms, would you mind giving a very quick description of what Crip studies are and what incarnational theology is? Oh, my. Okay. Crip. That is uh like um disability studies but honest man. So they they interrogate the normalcy of bodies, but they do so in a way that imagine something else. So like quip time doesn't just imagine more time for disabled bodies. It imagines a bending of time so that um you may not necessarily need more time all the time, but you need some more time here and here and here. And so, and I'm very, very articulate, but it's kind of like queer, queer studies in and looking at it on this land and, and this warp to norms. And incarnational theology is theology of the body of being created in God's image of Jesus Christ coming in to me fresh. And so what does that mean for us in relationship to God, to our bodies and to other bodies? Who do we count as holy and beloved? And how does that transform our relationship and our theology. Thank you. That's really helpful. I, I do find the description of, of Crip Studies and the bending, this idea of bending on a slant where uh, needs move away and come closer, creating distinct and unusual or unique spaces. Um, I find that a really helpful description. So thank you. That, that that does help. All right, um, Amy. So you explore self-injury um, and you acknowledge in some of your work that this is an interesting and perhaps complicated tension 
when we consider the Christian tradition that looks to an injured and suffering savior. I know this is something that I've always spent time thinking about and struggling with at times. Um, I find it particularly problematic when looking at boundary setting around women and responsibilities. How do, how do, you, how do you deal with that um, when sacrifice is really held up as a desirable, um, norm may not be the right word, but, but sort of when the savior we look to is, is really uh, embedded in a narrative of sacrifice. So I'm, I'm really interested in how you sort of live into this tension or address this tension between injury and suffering and the Christian narrative that in some ways celebrates suffering and injury. Um, and in particular, how, how do you address this for vulnerable people who may be trying to establish some protective boundaries? Yeah, this is an excellent question. I, um, I think there's a lot of different ways I could answer it for you, Laura. I think I'm gonna start and then we'll see where we go. So um, I think one of the things that I want to try to do in my work is encourage pastoral caregivers and psycho-spiritual therapists and, and other folks who might be providing care in a sort of formal or perhaps informal setting to people who self-injure is to perhaps consider more of a nuanced view of self-injury, nuanced and informed. Because what I've found in my research is that there seems to be a very black and white thing that happens with regards to self-injury. Um, and that is that it is wrong. It is wrong, it is bad, if you should not do it, you need to go to therapy immediately and you need to stop. And I'm not, I'm not advocating for self-injury and saying that I don't, would never say that I would want somebody to start self-injuring because it's not a healthy coping mechanism. There are other ways that we can learn to cope with our emotions. On the other hand, what I've read is that a lot of people have been really hurt by uh, ministers and other people in the church who react either with disgust, outright disgust that a person is doing this and the person becomes disgusting or fear. That's sort of the other emotion that comes up, which is this person should no longer allowed to, vol to volunteer at our church. They should be stripped of their leadership and they should, um, take a time out, I guess, while they go and have therapy and, and do some inner work. Um, and so I think that's kind of like one part of it. The other part of it is that with regards to the suffering savior. So um, in my dissertation, I'm presenting like a literature review on self-injury and how it's like popped up um, in theological history um throughout time and you know like we could go like way back uh way way back to the self-injury exists in the bible it's talked about um the prophets of Baal uh uh hurt themselves slashed themselves and also mark chapter five is another chapter that's often talked about uh when people are writing about self-injury in theology and that's when jesus encounters the get a scene to Montiac and he cuts himself with stones and he uh, lives among the tombs and Jesus comes and um, has an encounter with him and liberates him. Um, and so, you know, then we can go forward a little bit more. Origen, one of the fathers of the church, castrated himself uh, because he didn't want to become, uh, have an attraction to his students. Uh, we can go forward a little bit more, you know, um, a lot of the, um, there's some research that has come out on people who are preparing for battle during the crusades who would carve 
crosses on their foreheads and shoulders and backs because this is a part of their pre-battle ritual going forward a little bit more. You know, women who would slice off their noses, blind themselves, cut their face so that they wouldn't have to be married to a man. They could stay married to Christ. These are people who wanted to become a part of the, um, serve their lives as working as like a nun or, you know, we can go forward a little more. There's so many of these instances in the history of Christianity, you know, ascetic uh, people, um, saints who would, you know, self-flatulate, cut themselves, wear hair shirts, and I could go on and on and on. So this sort of thread is woven throughout Christianity. Um, and so what, I, what I'm hoping is that people will, this is what I was talking about when I was talking about the nuance. I hope that when people encounter people who self-injure, whether it's in their faith communities or like just like regular people you might meet here or there, um, they'll have a little bit more compassion for people who are self-injuring because they're not the first ones who've done this. It's been around for a long time. And I think there needs to be um, a little bit more kind of a nuanced or like I said, informed conversation that can go on with people. I hope that made sense. Yeah, thank you so much. That's that's actually very helpful. Um, and my guess is we may go a little bit further down this conversation as we begin to examine some of the, the pastoral care implications. So I'm yes. looking forward to that conversation. Thank you. So Miriam, I'm going to bring us back to uh, questions about the word crit. So in your work, you use the word crip often you and you work within crip studies and i found as i was reading your work it's an adjective at times it, it's describing something it might even be a verb in in an example being to crip a space um and i i became very interested in this word as i, I read your work and so i'm curious to hear you maybe expand a little bit more on on the word crip and why why you use the word crip the way you do um, what does it mean to you and how does this, particularly, I think maybe with respect to your work on your conversation around crypt studies and how it asks us to bend and rethink of time and space, um, how does that stretch our theological imagination when we think about bodies? Another easy one there for me, thank Lord. Um, so crip, crip come from purple, and it's a way of reclaiming that word by crips. So, and I, and I make, when we make Nancy Mayer's description of crip, it make people up and think about it. And it does people because oh no, we're not supposed to use that word anymore. Oh, so that that's and that. And so I like that this what the nature of that word because it points to the disruptive nature of our bodies and minds. And I and I've followed in the path of group studies and disability studies like Alison Kafer and Robert McCall and others who use it as a verb to quip time, to quip space, to make spaces not only accessible to 
people, but where people feel at home in their bodies and minds in that place. The one where the words about quips is being something like quip church, even though she's never been to church, this elusive and holy ground where quip bodies are desired and made to feel like they're at home. It goes beyond welcome and inclusion. Um, so I think in theology, it can push people beyond um, theologies of belonging, which I find to be I find to focus on assimilation versus diversity, whether or not that's the intention, that's how I experience belonging. And so I wrote a paper that's um, coming out soon, fairly soon, on the super quick body of Christ, where the church has made these super group and God called us prophets, but demand more and more from our bodies without making space for them. So I think it's a way to widen our theological conversations and deepen them beyond messages of belonging and beyond um, stories are important, but I don't think stories change society. I think getting below the stories and pulling up the, the a goodness of ableism and normalcy will help the church be the church we got people. Thank you. I actually, that was very helpful. I know I've struggled at times with some of the, the work around inclusion and I like really appreciate how you frame it if I'm hearing you correctly as going beyond belonging and welcome and inclusion to a, a deep sense of holy ground and at homeness am I hearing that correctly yeah, yeah I, I find that distinction very helpful thank you for making it um I, I was writing some notes down as I was listening to you because I I really like that that's it's it's, a, it's an area I've felt a bit hiccuped as well as I'm trying to sort of think through. So you that's been an enormously helpful distinction. Thank you. Amy, you in your work, um, you align, if I'm reading your work correctly, you are aligning much of your work with um, with narratives ground in the lived experience and emerging from very much a survivor's lens. Um, can you maybe elaborate a little bit more about that piece and what that means to you and why that distinction is important in, as we think about theological and pastoral implications of your work? Yeah, sure. So um, Miriam was talking about how her work is uh, using crypt studies as a dialogue partner and my work uses MAD studies as a dialogue partner. So uh, I see MAD studies as being kind of like the rebellious cousin of <laughs> critical disability studies. 
um, it's a little bit newer um, and it's also a little bit more, um, I don't know, like in your face. I don't know if that's the best way to say it, but um, it's very, when I first started reading about the CF, SX movement and CSXM movement, the consumer survivor X patient MAG movement. I thought, oh boy, this is what I've been looking for. This is the way, this is what's really going to help me kind of like frame out what I want to talk about. And I want to like become a part of this conversation. Um, Cause like, I don't know, I know Miriam and I have talked about this before. Like, um, I find like in theology, we can kind of, I feel anyway, we, we're behind a lot of the time. Like we're like, kind of like, I feel like we're always trying to catch up. Um, and I hope that with some of the work that Miriam and I are doing, we're like kind of like propelling ourselves forward a bit um, in what theology can do and the kind of conversations that like theology, like honestly should be a part of because there are people of faith and there, there are people who have obviously have like, like spirituality is like a really big part of their lives who are crip and mad people. And it's like, how are we, um, what kind of dialogue can these two, can crip and can crip studies have with theology and can mad studies have with theology? And all of us together, probably, that, that's kind of what we're trying to do with the journal and with the podcast. So, um, okay, so, the the mad studies um is really important to me because it kind of like it's like a it's like a check and balance like it basically um moves the seat of power from the sort of quote unquote professional to the like just regular person who has lived experience of mental uh, emotional or spiritual distress and one of the things that's really important is that um it sees mad people as being reliable and credible sources of knowledge. So a lot of the time what happens is when a person receives a diagnosis, it's like this automatic thing happens where, and I'll just speak from my own experience, where um, you're not reliable anymore. You're seen as like that person with that diagnosis and you need to like have a doctor like explain everything to you about what's going on and why it's going on. And this sort of like, like I said, kind of like flips the switch a little bit and um, makes space for and like um, honors the voices of people with lived experience. So um, when it comes to the pastoral care part, my opinion is that when it comes to self-injury, a lot of the stuff that's been written and that's kind of like floating around on the internet from a, a sort of like a Christian perspective is a lot of these people who are in the normal seat of power talking about what should be done instead of sitting and listen and being quiet and listening to what the people who have this experience are saying about what they need. It's a lot of like, this is what we've done in the past and this is what will work. And, you know, I'm sick of it, to be honest. And I really want to see, um, I really want to listen to what these people have to say because they know um, they're the experts in their own life and they're the ones who can tell us where we should be going and what we should be doing. I was reading something the other day um, from like a liberation theology perspective. And there's this idea of um, people being the protagonists in the story, like people with lived, lived experience of self-injury, having like this experience of being elevated to, to being the protagonist, as opposed to being like a side character. Um, so I wanna see that happen. I think the other thing uh, with the MAD studies is that um, I want, I really want with some of my teaching as well, um, people to know how badly mad people have been treated throughout history. Because I think there's, at least for myself, I knew how a lot of people with physical and intellectual disabilities have been treated, but I didn't know as much about the, the mad people. Um, you know, 
even like I just read a paper the other day about the history of lobotomies in Ontario and how people will, people who are with quote unquote mental illness were lobotomized. Um, yeah, and the one the one last thing that I might say about the the Mad Pride movement or the Mad Studies side is that um, there's an explicit rejection of the biomedical approach. So seeing people with lived experience of mental and, emo and emotional distress as quote unquote broken and in need of a quote unquote cure. So most of the time this cure is like, a lot of people say, tell me your story, I'll give you a diagnosis and I'll give you some meds. This is like the cycle that we get stuck in. Um, or there's like these quote unquote treatments like you know, electroshock therapy, restraints, like I said before, lobotomies, forced confinement. So the MAD study side, the MAD pride side really uh, interrogates this, what, what we're doing as a, in Canada, around the world, to people who are MAD and, and uh, they want, we want better, we want better treatment. We wanna be seen as people who are credible, reliable, people. Thank you so much. It's one of the things that I love about both of your work is how deeply it's embedded in the lived experience. And, and it explores um, this interrelationship between lived experience, expertise, power, knowledge, who gets to hold it, um, I really value your contributions to that conversation. So thank you for that. Miriam, so returning to pastoral care, um, as you know, I'm very interested in care and the dance of care in some ways in terms of the dance between people who receive care and provide care. And you speak of that in your work and you particularly um, explore how people with leadership positions in the church who live with disabilities, both receive and provide care and how this can be very disruptive. Um, and it really challenges many of our understandings of care. And you then explore this idea of intimacy and crypt theology with regard to care, which intrigued me. And I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. So if you could maybe explain that a little bit further and then um, expand on this discussion in terms of how it maybe allows us to develop a more holistic understanding of care, um, broadly speaking, theologically speaking. I'll stop now. Thanks. You know, and I would just say that I'm at the very beginning of trying to figure out this puzzle. So I will maybe give some edge pieces today, but they don't have the whole picture sorted out. So I'm tying patro care with access intimacy, which is a term that Mia Mingus uses. She coined the term. She's a Korean disabled queer, um, Amer Korean American disabled queer woman who talk about access intimacy versus force intimacy. And she said it's this elusive feeling when someone else gets your access needs. Sometimes it's by complete strangers, disabled or not, and sometimes it's built over years. She says it could also be the way your body relaxes and opens up when 
with someone when all your access need to be met. And so that relaxation of the body reminded me of a good hospital care relationship when needs are being met. Emotional needs, but also like physical needs also also as spiritual needs I and I remember the the summer I did some part of care with my families and there was one family who had a bad car accident and this woman had a bad concussion and I've had many too many concussions over the years and so that those moments of sitting with her and being able to understand not fully but understand what she was going through I think was a comfort in space for her to be an infant. It allowed her to share more deeply and more profoundly than me. Now you may have to ask her if that was the case, but that's my impression of that. And so this, this access intimacy makes me think of Jesus when he met people and listened to their joys and knew, knew what they needed in that time. And and because he was Jesus, he was able to uh, offer exactly what was needed. And I think, you know, Koji can't live up to that ideal. We're not the Messiah. But we, we can be more in tune with people's needs. And so that's, that's what they imagine an access intimacy in those relationships. And it is also. I think provides a way of talking about communal care so that it's not only one person offering and one person receiving, it's multiple people offering and receiving because that's who who we are as Christians. Well, we're multiple people caring for one another and sharing intimate, holy moments at, at our best moments. Thank you. Um, that's, I, I'm particularly interested in the idea of access intimacy in a caregiving relationship. So I'll look forward to reading your work on that as it evolves. I think it, it's a really interesting idea and 
and uh, yeah, I'm just interested in learning more. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so I have some questions that um, are really directed to both of you. So I'm going to just lob them out and then you guys can decide how you'd like to respond, whether you'd like to, yeah, jointly respond, take turns. Yeah, your call. So as I was reading your work, one of the things that really struck me is that really you are both deeply concerned with the body and embodiment. Um, and so I, as I, I really tried to get my head around your work and the questions you're struggling with, I was curious about how you feel sort of embodiment and bodies and sort of a theology of the body um, is important to your work, um, but also maybe your theology um, and, you know, and how that then in sort of sort of intertwines with the lived experience. So it's, it's sorry, it's a complicated, muddy question, but I, I'm, I'm interested in this idea of the theology of the body and how you see the body informing your work. Um, yeah, what do you think? Miriam, do you want to take a stab at it or don't me to? <laughs> I can think of that. Yeah, it wasn't a well articul articulated question. I apologize, <laughs> but I'll let you guys have fun with it. No, it's a, it's a good question. And I think it goes back to my incarnation, uh, our incarnational theology as Christians. And how I was, I was, I've been doing some work on my preaching tab to make me. And we didn't ever tell the puppet was set up for certain kinds of bodies for male, white, tall bodies to fit into that space. And how often women or other people wear albs in, in an attempt to cover their body or to to get away from those sexist conversations of, oh, I love your dress today. Oh, I love those shoes you were wearing. But how I've been thinking of it is I, can't hide my body. Even when I wear out, my wheelchair is visible. And so my body in that wheelchair is visible. And so we need to have a positive view of bodies to do to see that we're all created in God's image in Jesus' image and we're here to celebrate God's presence in us. Both Mary God and Tom into the disability judges path and why does she worship the significance of staring and staring back. So she says, staring 
is the normative case on disabled bodies, but staying back, we're saying now we're supposed to be here preaching or dancing or performing. We're supposed to be here, look at our bodies and see that we exist. So it's, it's, um, it goes against the quip erasure, the erasing of bodies that can happen. So my, my lived experience of being scared at and being uncomfortable with the chair to inviting the chair as a preacher is informing how I think about my body in in church and in society. I'm not sure if that answered your question at all, but I think there's there's something there about about inviting the chair and saying, no, I am different and I am disabled, and that's okay that I belong here, oh, I hate the word belonging. I am here to preach. I am here to offer care. Yeah, and I wonder if this idea of this, I, you know, this is my home, I, you know, a home is your space. And so I am here, I am in my home. And therefore I have, you know, sort of the responsibility and the authority and, um, the, you know, all of all of the, yeah, I, I like how you, you weave it into um, sort of demanding us to go beyond inclusion and belonging and to think about presence and home and yeah, I just, I find that very helpful. Thank you. I might riff off something that Miriam was saying too, just for a moment. This idea of hiding the body, I think is really something that um, is important for my research too, because so many people who self-injure hide their wounds from others. Um, this is a, this is a, a big thing. And, um, a lot of the times, let's say when pastoral caregivers are given a list of, you know, quote unquote, what to look for, for kids in their youth group um, who might be self-injuring at the top of that list will always be wearing long sleeves in hot weather, constantly having, um, you know, bulky clothing on to hide what's, what's happened. And um, I think there's a, there's something to be said about a theology of, um, of, of being able, to, feeling the at homeness enough to be able to show someone what has happened, what is happening, um, and show your wounds, and you know, sort of on the more like uh, um, the side of like policy when it comes to self injury is like a good question that youth ministers have to grapple with is if a if a young person comes into our church with fresh self-injury cuts, do we ask them to cover them up? Because con social contagion is a real thing. And um, other kids might learn about how to self-injure from this person. So there's a, there's a debate that's going on about, should somebody be asked to cover up? Because they might unintentionally, um, not encourage, but they might unintentionally a cause, I don't know if that's the right word, pe other people to do this, or should they be, should they be asked to, to, to cover up? And these are all, uh, 
questions that I'm thinking about, like from a theological perspective, um, I'm not sure if I really have all the answers, but I think Miriam's, um, I, I thank Miriam for bringing up the idea of hiding and today. That's, that was really interesting to think about. So thanks, Miriam. Yeah, thank you so much. This has been really helpful and interesting. So sort of the last question, which I'll launch out to both of you, is how do you hope this work you're doing will impact the church, church leadership, and people in the church? What, do you, what are your hopes for your work? Uh, who wants to go first? I might, I might start us off. So um, I was thinking about this question yesterday and um, when Miriam and I were writing our editorial for the, the spring issue of the journal that came out, we were thinking about um, the issue that just came out is a lot of writing from people with lived experience of taking psychiatric medications for different things, different uh, mental health conditions. And so we wanted to see this, this issue as um, like an offering to God from a group of Crip and Mad Saints. We really want to see, um, we really want to like join with other Crip and Mad people who are, who either have said something already or who want, have something to say um, and who want to join us in this work that we're doing. And we also wanted to um, offer up the issue free from shame, um, free from shame of because we're disabled, because we're not sane, um, that God, God gets us and, and accepts us. And the other thing that, that I'm hoping will happen sort of out of my research and also through the, our journal work is that we're not necessarily um, looking for like shiny and polished work from people uh, as they're joining into this conversation. We're looking for like sort of like raw and hurt and angry voices to come and talk about what's going on because we just want to like wade into the muck of it all and be a part of this conversation that like predates us but also is like moving forward in time so yeah we we hope that we can continue to like wade into the depths with people and I would agree with all of Amy what Amy said and say for my work, I want, I would love for the church to take disabled and quit body seriously and our leadership and not, not hold us up for a moment in time to say how diverse or inclusive we are, but to take seriously the different ways of ministry that we offer, returning to my opening, opening remark about how people can offer ministry that that are different and that bring, bring God's vision of the kingdom in ways that other people can and we we don't offer in ways that other people can and it goes both Ways, but I'm hoping it opens up people's imagination to even consider having quite mad folks in leadership. 
positions. Now, <laughs> that's a lofty goal. Um, I'm not sure if thesis can do that, but um, for the thesis, I hope that just the three or four readers who have to read my thesis are uh, uh, um, proud of that book and can help me help me share it further. Well, you know, I already think that anything you write is golden and is going to change the world. So I think there's going to be more than three or four people reading your work, Miriam. Me too. Um, yeah, so I'm looking at the time and I'm aware we're sort of coming up at the one hour mark. Um, I'm just wondering, do you guys have any final thoughts about your work that you'd like to share or any questions for each other that you'd like to ask before we say goodbye? I may just say briefly, I've been um, very um, appreciative I remember when I first started doing my PhD, my supervisor, Pam McCarroll said, kept saying to me, Amy, you have like trust the process. And um, I really, I really think that that was very wise. And um, I think that I wasn't quite sure like what this whole journey would be like when I first started um, in 2017, but I feel that um, it's been, like such a it's been a humbling experience for me because I realize how much I don't know and how much I will never know but this tiny slice that I've been have the privilege of being able to research and think about over the past couple of years has just really been life-changing for me and I feel like it's um if anyone who's listening is thinking about doing a doing more theological research or, or pursuing doctoral work I would definitely um, encourage you to do it because um, I've just seen myself grow in so many ways. I never in a million years thought, would have thought that I would be on a podcast, <laughs> let alone, you know, having the guts and courage to sort of journal and all these beautiful things that have grown out of um, meeting, you know, my friend Miriam and you, Laura, and others who have been, um, on this journey with me. So I'm very thankful to God for all of these blessings. Yeah, it is a real privilege to do this work and it's a real blessing, even though it's very tiring. I've, I've been napping a lot lately. Even though I get, I don't know, the normal amount of sleep at night. So I think that's something to say too. Like, if you do this work, you will be tired. <laughs> and that's, that's okay. Have a nap. No one, no one will know except the podcast listeners now. But it's so important for, for the church, for the field of theology, and for yourself. It's really been significant learning about myself as I do this work. So thank you, Laura, for asking the hard questions today. Thank you so much for inviting me. This was so much fun. And I guess I just, I'm going to 
take advantage of this opportunity to thank you both for the work you're doing. You, I think, are the work you are doing with the Canadian Journal and with these podcasts and with um, really creating this wonderful space for all of us to have these really exciting conversations without the pressure of having all the answers. Um, and that this appreciation that the, the journey and the exploration is, is a whole lot of the fun and where some of the magic happens. And I'm just enormously grateful for the work you're doing and the risks you're taking in this work. Um, and then today for sharing your work and for allowing the tables to be turned and, uh, and jumping into the hot seats and, uh, and answering some of the questions. And I look forward to reading more of your work. I look forward to, uh, to these conversations that we'll continue to have. Um, and I'm just enormously grateful that I get to share this journey with you. So thank you. Thank you for everything you're doing and thank you for including me and thank you for your answers and uh, the conversation today. It's been really wonderful. Thank you.